Good evening to all our viewers from the IIT Alumni Center in Bangalore. Uh, over the last 18 months, uh, all of us have been consuming a lot of bandwidth on Zoom. Uh, it's, uh, probably very likely that uh, every one of us is, uh, you know, attending several meetings on Zoom on a daily basis or watching webinars or uh, perhaps even concerts these days. Uh, and guess what? All of them consume bandwidth and, you know, uses the internet as a backbone to, you know, ship this bandwidth uh, around the world. And we couldn't think of a more relevant topic than what we have today for our 37th webinar since the first lockdown was announced in India. Uh, and that's on, uh, you know, the backbone of the information society, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, the fiber optic strategy that we are talking about today. Uh, it is estimated that next year, 2022, there will be about uh, 273 exabytes of information flowing through uh, the internet and an additional 77 exabytes flowing through the mobile internet. So giving you a total of 350 exabytes. This is a number for 2022. I think we are very well on the way to you know, reach that. And you know, I was curious what an exabyte was and an exabyte is a billion gigabytes. So it's a large number with many zeros. Uh, so, you know, it's a serious number that actually flows through the internet. And, you know, it wouldn't surprise you uh, in the age of Alexa and Siri that there are more than 10 billion devices on the internet today. All right, so uh, there are 10 billion pieces that are talking to something or the other or somebody or the other on the internet. So this is the kind of uh, dependence that we have on information flows and i think it's important that we discuss this topic and we are very very fortunate to have uh, professor ragunath shivagankar uh, emeritus professor at iit bombay uh, to talk to us uh, about this uh, uh, professor shivagankar did his mtech and phd's and phd both from uh, iit bombay uh, will not go deep into his bio and take up his time we'd rather listen to him but there are a few things uh, that are important that, uh, you know, he's been director at IIT Delhi. He's been the cha vice chancellor at uh, the University of Pune, vice chancellor at Bennett University, and has held several offices uh, in IIT Bombay itself. Uh, needless to say, recipient fellow of the IEEE, uh, NASI, INA, and many other societies. So all in all, highly accomplished, uh, you know, uh, you know, academician, a highly, a highly regarded teacher, uh, and you will see the power of his talk when he delivers it now. And we've been also fortunate to get uh, a friend, Sri Prakash Pandey, uh, founder of a company called Comtel. Uh, interestingly, his uh, tagline for his company is making connections. Uh, which is what we are all about, uh, is making connections, uh, whether we do it in person or through Zoom or through a piece of fiber optic cable. Uh, it's all about making connections. So uh, thanks, Sri Prakash, for uh, you know, helping out to moderate this session. A uh, few uh, hygiene questions for our audience. Uh, please do not put any questions in the chat box. There is a Q&A box at the bottom right hand of your screen. Uh, uh, right hand side of your screen. So please put the uh, questions and answers there because that's the box that we will be monitoring for asking the questions. Uh, the chat box is, you know, if you want to say hello to somebody, that's fine, but you know, ignore the chat box as much as you can. Also, please don't bother raising hands because we lower them quite quickly as well. Uh, so there's no point in raising hands. Just put whatever you have to say on the Q&A box and we will try to address them during the two breaks that we have. Uh, finally, I also want to uh, introduce uh, my colleague, Dr. Sushila Venkatraman, who will, uh, towards the end of this, uh, uh, summarize the conversation and the key takeaways. 
and after that this uh, this uh, webinar is being recorded and within 48 hours you will find it up on the uh, youtube channel of iit alumni center bengaluru uh, so if you want to share that with friends colleagues uh, who would have missed the the live show so to speak please feel free to do that with that uh, professor shivgankar over to you thank you uh, thank you ashok for a very nice introduction and setting the ball rolling uh, first of all i would like to thank professor mishra uh, who invited me to give a talk uh, in this seminar series i think it is indeed a privilege uh, to give a talk uh, under iit alumni center at bangalore also i want to thank uh, shri prakash pande who is a old friend of mine uh, for more than maybe 30 years uh he has been doing wonders in uh, telecom industry also thanks to sushila for making uh, wonderful arrangements uh, you know for this seminar and it is indeed a pleasure to have interaction uh, through this seminar series which is organized by iit alumni club at bangalore so let me share my screen uh, Can you see my screen now? Yes, professor. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. All right. So, so good afternoon uh, to everyone who is there for this seminar. And the topic uh, Ashok has already introduced. We are going to talk about uh, the optical fibers, uh, which is the backbone for the modern uh, telecommunication network. Now, if you look at uh, the last one century, I think you will see there are very milestone kind of technology which, which were evolved in last 100 years which really changed the way we think the way the whole society functions the way the interaction take place and so on and so on so few in last 100 years if you look at the technologies which really made impact uh, on the humanity as a whole of course the few few may i have mentioned here like semiconductor electronics then you are having a high speed transportation the communication and information technology biotechnology material science and many others you know which have got tremendous impact uh, on the society today we are going to talk about uh, the technology which is the information and communication technology which had a catastrophic effect on the society in fact it grew so catastrophically in last about 50 60 years that nobody would have imagined the way we are today interacting with each other about 50 years back and this technology essentially created a world which is a highly interconnected world so in fact the proximity concept because of this technology is now completely gone anybody across the world you can talk to him as easily as you can talk to your neighbor so it created a connected world it changed the paradigm of the society what it means is that essentially the world has become now more information centric we can extend the information very easily you know at, at a convenience and many times we call this is a three year society that we have information for anyone anytime anywhere and this technology really provides uh, that kind of access this also changed the teaching learning paradigm and uh, we'll talk about it uh, in a minute the way even the students learn the whole university models actually got transformed because of this technology in last about 20 30 years so this technology they played a very important role when we talk about information and communication technology specifically where do we use this in fact we use for all over uh, today if you look at so we have major applications of course we are in computers in their networks we use that in smart grids we use for the smartphones there are smart cities uh, which are now getting developed we are having industrial internet automated digital technology then we are having electronic devices getting connected and of course now we are going to talk about the smartphones when we come 5g and so on and so on so icd if you really look at it is all over uh, wherever you can have any interaction with another person today i think the ict is going to be a part of that specifically if i ask you that ict which the internet is the backbone of ict where do we use the internet the internet today is used for so many applications 
it is used for sending and receiving emails it is used for searching and browsing information archives it is used for copying files between computers conducting financial transactions navigation when you are driving a car or any any, any vehicle it sort of helps you navigating uh, yourself playing interactive games the video and music the streaming chat video communication direct messaging video conferencing and at the end the education i have put here because in last one year or one and a half year if you look at after the pandemic started in fact the internet technology played a very major role into the education system you can imagine if the internet the things were not there one and a half year back practically we would have we would have be we would have become stand still right uh, the university interaction would have been completely stopped however since the internet technology was very much in place the universities kept on functioning the classes went on functioning so the internet technology actually created played a very important role right in the pandemic for the education uh, at as a whole now if i look at the users uh, the ashok has already mentioned uh, some numbers at the beginning but just to give you some numbers here that if you talk about the internet users distribution worldwide you will see that this pie diagram gives you the the user which are in asia europe africa latin america north america middle east and so on and so on in fact almost more than 50% of users of internet are in asian uh, region right and the next is uh, europe and then you are having uh, uh, the us and uh, other areas right but 50% of the users actually come from uh, the, the asian country if you look at the country wise distribution for the internet users and here there are top 20 countries which i have shown here the top most of course is china uh, which is uh, this data is maybe about a year old uh, so number might have increased a little bit here and there but about 854 million users you will see in china the india you will see about 560 million the next comes from united states which is about 292 million and then so on and so on so again you see that Uh, in asian countries also the china and india they really constitute a major portion of the internet users uh, you know in, in the today's time if i give you some uh, uh, some statistics uh, which has been sort of available on 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 internet again there are about 7.8 billion people in the world that's the there's the population right out of which 56% is urbanized uh you have the unique mobile phone user which are about 5.27 billion you have internet users about 4.72 billion and uh, active social media users about 4.33 billion so 60% of the total population which you have you about that uses the internet and almost 55% use the the social media today for interaction how much time this user spend on internet and this is a very interesting number almost 6 to 7 hours on average people use on internet today for various kind of interact and that is almost like 92% of the total thing available and so on when you come to social media you will see again on average about 2 to 2 uh, and a half hours time on average each one spent on the social media so these are really the mind boggling numbers the way people are really engaged uh, through this internet and this technology for interaction uh, and transferring information uh, from one one location to another so to cellular connections also including the iot if you put it right these numbers are about 10 billion or almost 11 billion and the annual change which is going to take place uh, is about 5% 5 to 6% about 560 million users are getting added right including iot every year so the growth is really uh, very very uh, rapid right the numbers are very high and the growth is also very very rapid so if i just summarize this uh, slides here uh, the use of social media continues to grow with global users reaching 4.33 billion in april 2021 which is more than 55% of the total uh, population of the earth the number of users increased by 13.7% 13 in past 12 months which is more than 1.4 million new users every day getting added to this social media and the six social media platforms claim that they have more than 1 billion monthly active users sending visual text content for more than 6 hours a day if i put that transfer translate that everything into what kind of 
bytes are getting exchanged every day this number is 2.5 quintillion bytes generated per day which is ex exa uh, bytes which are generated per day this unit which ashok told at the beginning which is 10 to the power 18 uh, bytes which are getting generated every day if you transfer that into per second kind of uh, exchange of uh, bits that will turn out to be almost 300 terabits uh, per second kind of exchange uh, you know every sustained way right across the globe which is which is taking place so now we see that when we have this special media and the internet with a huge amount of data which is getting transferred uh, across the world from one location to another and this has not happened overnight actually if you really look at the evolution of technology right that actual telecommunication in some sense started almost you know about 1800 middle of 1800 something telephones came at the beginning of the last century which was about 1900 and then this telephone exchange or voice communication uh, the, the bandwidth increase right to the coaxial cables and it went to microwave and the growth was the, the, the plot shown here is almost linear but the vertical scale is actually logarithmic so actually the growth is exponential so you see that the bandwidth and the bandwidth distance product what actually characterizes the communication system it is went with constant exponential constant from almost 1900 to about 1950s uh, or 1960 around that time the technology which was using microwaves or radio frequencies that was almost getting saturated and people were looking for a new medium for increasing the bandwidth and the capacity for sending more information so suddenly you will see in the middle of 60s a new technology actually came into picture and that is the technology which is the optical technology and suddenly the slope of this this curve change uh, and then the growth of exponential growth of telecommunication network further enhanced after 60 after the optical uh, technology got got into picture so that is the uh, uh, sort of a growth uh, which has taken place here now when i look at uh, a high capacity kind of a channel for transmitting huge amount of information across the world i essentially fall back on the most fundamental uh, expression which is what is called the shannon's channel capacity now what is channel first channel channel capacity it tells you the highest bit rate you can transmit on the on the channel with arbitrarily low error probability and this channel capacity is having two parameters here one is b which is the bandwidth of the channel which is the it is in hertz and you are having s by n this quantity where s is the signal power and n is the noise power so this quantity s by n essentially is signal to noise ratio uh, of, on your channel and b is the bandwidth with the channel has so when we define a capacity of of a channel the capacity depends upon these two quantities the bandwidth and also depends upon signal to noise ratio so we see here that the fundamental parameters for defining the capacity of a communication channel right is bandwidth which is in some sense proportional to frequency So if we increase the frequency by a factor of 10, typically the bandwidth also will increase more or less by a factor of 10. So when I go to radio frequencies or microwaves, the radio frequencies are of the order of 10 to the power 10 hertz, right? 10 billion uh, hertz. That is the radio frequency in microwaves. If I go to optical frequency, then the optical frequency is 10 to the power 14 hertz, which is almost four orders of magnitude higher. That is 10,000 times more. That means if I increase the, if I go to optical frequencies. then the bandwidth is more or less will increase almost by 10000 times and that was a very attractive proposition in 60s because suddenly probably you could increase uh, the the bandwidth of your channel by about 10000 times second parameter which is the signal to noise ratio the if you assume, assume the noise is independent of signal then higher the signal better the signal to noise ratio but when the signal travels on the channel essentially it attenuates its signal amplitude drops because of losses and higher the losses more the signal amplitude decrease will be that means if i want to have a high signal to noise ratio then this this is inversely proportional to the loss so that means if i want to have a high channel capacity uh, in any communication system 
I should have a, as large a bandwidth as possible. And at the same time, the channel should have a, as low loss as possible. These are the two fundamental things essentially we are looking for when we talk about a high capacity communication channel. So the two fundamental questions then arise, and the thought was in the middle of 60s, that if you wanted to increase the channel capacity, is there a medium that has a low loss and large bandwidth? And that time, if you go to optical domain, the material seemed to be very attractive was the glass, because glass seemed to be the most transparent material available at that point of time, right? And that was more in the visible range. Later on, we'll see the visible range is probably not that suited uh, as uh, other infrared, but at that time, the glass seemed to be the most transparent material for light. Second question which was there, that even if you are having a medium which is available, do we have the proper sources which can send information? Right? Because every light source cannot really carry information. It cannot, it cannot, be changing, cannot change its properties like frequency, phase, and amplitude which carries the information. So at the same time, more or less same time, the lasers were invented. So these two questions which are more fundamental for the high capacity channel, like the medium which is required and the, and the, and the source right, which can carry information, both were simultaneously solved incidentally right, in the middle of 60s. And that's where was the origin of the optical communication. Now when we talk about optical communication, these are the two gentlemen, I think we should really give the credit for the optical communication. One is Narendra Singh Kapani, I, uh, he is uh, American of Indian origin, and he is called the father of fiber optics. In fact, he was the first one to really coin the word which is fiber optics. I was sending the light using the optical fiber. Second person is the Charles Cow. He got the uh, Nobel Prize in 2008 or 2009, uh, you know, for inventing optical fibers. Though the Kapani was the founder or the father of optical fiber, Probably Charles Cow, he found the application of optical fibers in communication. And the importance of optical fibers could be more realized after the internet came. And that's the reason after the internet impact was seen on the society, uh, the Nobel Prize was given to Charles Cow uh, for making use of optical fibers for communication. So these two are the people who have to be uh, credited uh, for this wonderful invention. Now, if I look at uh, the, the glass as the material, and if I see how the loss profile of this material is, you will see something interesting characteristic here. The attenuation actually goes low in these two windows. One window is 1300 nanometer, and other window which is around 1550 nanometer. In between, there is a there is a spike here which comes because of the material from water molecule five uh, spike, but that you at the moment. So you see there are two windows naturally you see, and this is not in the visible range. The visible range in nanometer is 400 nanometer to 700 nanometer, so which is somewhere here. That means the glass is far more transparent in infrared rather than the visible range as the normal people think. So if you wanted to use a low loss uh, window of this material, either one should operate in 1300 nanometer window or one should operate at 1550 nanometer. So that is the uh, property of glass. And then each window, if you look at, you will see that there are about 120 nanometer you will see, which turns out to be equal to almost 15 tera hours kind of bandwidth, uh, giving about 30 tera hours bandwidth total in two windows, in 1300 nanometer and 1550 nanometer. So if I take glass as a material and use it as a channel for sending information, the glass as a, as a low loss window, it provides you almost 30 tera hours bandwidth, right, intrinsically. Now, the question is, if this low loss window which the glass has, can it be accessed very easily in the in sending pulses, in the uh, sending information in the form of pulses? And that means, can we access the window in what is called the time domain access? But if I do that, then I will require the pulses which will be having a width almost inverse of this bandwidth. That will turn out to be almost 0 0.07 picosecond. Right? And pico is to the power minus uh, 12 seconds. This kind of pulse generation, especially in semiconductor uh, electronics, is almost impossible. We will not be able to generate them. So too difficult to generate electronically this, this kind of pulses there. And that is the reason, though the bandwidth is the optical, this glass could provide almost 13 terahertz. The data could be transmitted maximum only up to 10 Gbps, right? Because electronics will not really support, though the medium would support. 
second thing the pulses cannot be uh, made more narrow than that because the pulses when they travel in this medium this medium is a dispersive medium and we'll talk about that in a minute so when the pulses travel on that the pulses broaden and because of that the data rate actually reduces so when the glass you want to make the communication channel it is made in the form of what is called an optical fiber an optical fiber is a cylindrical uh, solid glass rod structure which is having uh, a core which is shown here in the diameter uh, diagram and which is surrounded by a shell which is called a cladding which is again made of glass and the difference between the refractive indices between the core and the cladding is very small it is almost 10 to the power minus 3 and the outer layers which are given here they are essentially provide the mechanical support to this glass thin rod right which is very easily breakable because the glass is intrinsically a brittle material so that's where the uh, that's how the optical fiber is made and the light is launched from the end of the tip of the optical fiber right and it propagates into this region which is the core and the cladding region right which is shown in the lower uh, diagram here however when i look at uh, the uh, propagation of light the light when it goes into a medium like op uh, the optical fibers it does not go in the form of rays you know which normally the common people think in fact the light propagates inside the optical fiber in very definite intensity patterns and these intensity patterns are what are called the modes of the optical fiber so here i have shown the different intensity patterns which can propagate inside an optic core of the optical fiber okay and depending upon the size of the core more number of modes can propagate inside the optical fiber so you i make thicker the core more and more modes actually will start propagating simultaneously inside the optical fiber and again each mode which is going to propagate or each intensity pattern which i have will have the two orthogonal states of polarization of light right? and these actually travel independently inside the optical fiber and later on we'll see its use from the communication point of view so if i if so if we want to to send the information on the optical fiber <clears throat> we can send either using only one mode or i can i can use the multiple modes by sending information right there but when the multiple modes are sent they each mode actually has its own correct propagation characteristic and if you send us information by using multiple modes then the information gets split into various modes and when the information is received on the other side it is far more distorted right when multiple modes are propagated so normally if you wanted to really get the least amount of distortion of the signal when it propagates on optical fiber you should send just probably one mode inside the optical fiber and that's what is what is called the single mode optical fiber for sending information which has the highest uh, data handling capability right and over the, the longest possible distance now the when the mode propagates or even is even in a single mode uh, propagates inside the optical fiber the phenomena which restricts the data rate uh, on the optical fiber is what is called dispersion now what is dispersion the dispersion is a different wavelengths travel with different velocity so if i take optical fiber here and uh, i i launch a narrow pulse uh, inside the optical fiber you will see that when the pulse emerges out of the optical fiber the pulse will be far more broadened right compared to what the pulse was actually launched inside the optical fiber so here is given so if the single pulse was transmitted you will get a broadened pulse there will not be much problem but when you are transmitting multiple train of pulses when the pulses start broadening they will start overlapping and they will they will start losing information so from here we see that the data rate actually depends upon the this quantity what is called dispersion which is the pulse broadening per per, per unit distance per spectral width of the source <coughs> so the pulse broadening depends upon the distance more the pulse travels on the distance more it broadens and the, it depends also on the spectral width of the source now this is very interesting that the spectral width of the source when we talk about this is coming because of the intrinsically because of the laser source or the optical carrier which we are using in fact from communication point of view the normal semiconductor lasers are not as monochromatic as we think in fact they are having a spectral width of almost 1 to 2 nanometers which if you translate into the bandwidth they will have a bandwidth of almost about 2 to 300 gigahertz bandwidth the data rate we are transmitting is only about 10 gbps but the spectral width of intrinsic carrier itself is about 2 to 300 gigahertz and because of that the pulse broadening actually is 
proportional to the spectral width of the stone. So the data rate, which is inversely proportional to the pulse width, and a data rate distance product becomes a figure of merit. That means on an optical channel, we can trade in one for another. <coughs> we can have high data rate over short distance and uh, the low data rate over long, long distance and so on. So we can actually have this kind of thing. So the dispersion, you can see it could be because of material intrinsically, like a glassy dispersive material, and this is God given. You, you have made a fiber out of glass and it has become an optical waveguide. And then the dispersion depends upon what is the refractive index profile which you see inside the optical fiber. Third dispersion which you see is because of polarization. That the two different polarization travel with different velocities, and because of that, the signal gets distorted. This is because of the fabrication. And then you have multiple modes propagating, you get dispersion here. What is interesting to note here is that the first one, material dispersion, is God given. The fabrication, also because of technology limitation, you will be having certain control over that but there will be always residual, some manufacturing defects which will remain. This waveguide dispersion is something very, very interesting, which can be manipulated by changing the refractive index profile. And that's what actually people did, the technologists. They came up with various different refractive index kind of profiles to really get different dispersion characteristics. So initially, when you take a simple optical fiber where the refractive index are constant inside the core, the dispersion was zero at around 1310 nanometers. And this was the dispersion characteristic, which is given by the red box. Then the low loss, lowest loss in the optical fiber is around 1550 nanometers. So the changing the refractiveness profile, the dispersion characteristics was changed to get a zero dispersion around uh, the 1550 nanometer. And then we got a new class of fibers, what are called the dispersion shifted fibers, for which the dispersion is 0 at 1550, where the loss is also minimum. And then uh, we got, okay, the, again, the characteristic, again, by manipulating the effective index profile, where the loss could be low all over the, the band, which is from 1300 nanometer to 1550 nanometer. Right? So this by manipulation with refractive index and manipulation of the dispersion on the optical fiber, that became actually a, a, a game, right? In the 80s and 90s, you could create variety of optical fibers with a variety of dispersion characteristics. The most interesting uh, part which you see from this diagram is that dispersion can be positive or negative. What does it mean? Positive and dispersion, negative dispersion, dispersion means broadening of the pulse. So negative dispersion doesn't mean narrowing of the pulse it itself. The positive and negative both dispersion actually broaden the pulse. But if you make a combination of these two, then they can nullify each other and the broadening of the pulse then can be controlled by using the combination of these two. So now if I look at uh, how the evolution of optical network took place from 1960 or 70s uh, after the, uh, the, uh, the lasers and the optical fibers were generated. The first generation optical transmission started EA850 nanometer. And that time the fiber which was used by multimode fiber and to control the dispersion because of the multimode propagation, the fiber we used was what are called the graded index refractive uh, index fiber. Right? So instead of having a constant refractive index inside the core, if you can sort of gradually taper it, then you can control uh, the dispersion on the optical fiber because of the various pro modes propagating inside that. And that could give you a larger bandwidth uh, than having a uniform refractive index and the first generation uh, thing got in the middle of 70s, and you can have a channel capacity, channel uh, capacity distance product, which is almost like about 10 Gbps kilometer kind of uh, the channel capacity uh, and distance product which you could get that time. The second generation of you obviously was around 1310 nanometer because that's where the dispersion of the normal optical fiber was crossing zero. That means if you operate it at 1310 nanometer, the dispersion is practically zero. That means that will that is the wavelength at which one could get the highest transmission data rate at that point of time. Right? And the fiber, fiber which was used was the single mode optical fiber. And by using this, then the, the capacity distance product actually could be increased by almost factor of 10 to 20, 30. And that's how you got a second generation uh, transmission there. <coughs> then came the third generation, where now the dispersion shifted fibers were, were, were made available. 
the 1550 nanometer window which was the really the lowest possible uh, loss window which was available from the glass uh, loss profile that was the one which was the, the third generation uh, transmission which took place and which took the data rate almost uh, about 1000 uh, gigabits per second kilometer uh, kind of transmission right, which took place there and then it started sort of flattening uh, in in 80s right because of uh, the 1550 nanometer window right the data rate was getting saturated if you look at all the three generations you see something interesting here that optical technology was not playing a great role actually from one generation to another what was actually playing role was the more electronics and its multiplexing these all the systems if you see from telecommunication point of view they were the most primitive kind of telecommunication system that means the bits were generated they were transmitted they were only on off kind of pulses the either for zero you know don't transmit signal from one to transmit a bit which is one so only binary data which was transmitted uh, which is electronically generated and only the laser is modulated to convert into light and send on the optical file and the time division multiplexing is used here no sophisticated communication multiplexing technology actually was used at that point and then we developed the standards for time division multiplexing what are called sonnets hth and and so on right and that's what actually the third generation transmission took place so if i look from first to third generation communication systems you are having a, a transmitter and you are having a receiver and for sending or receiving information you can have one fiber for forward transmission one for uh, for backward transmission right and a single channel is are transmitted per fiber and whatever maximum uh, capacity with the fiber can take and as i said it could be a, not more than about 10 gbps each fiber would carry just about 10 gbps data one direction and 10 gbps data on another direction maximum and the wavelength could be used which could be 1310 nanometer or 1550 nanometer so the standard which were used for multiplexing and building on a higher data rates uh, in time domain they were actually what is called optical carrier or the synchronous transmission mode uh, kind of carriers and uh, the oc3 which was taken uh, almost like a base kind of uh, thing which is 155 mbps per second and which is called oc3 and then it was in multiples of of this 155.52 uh, the higher data rate uh, networks were built using optical communication but again the entire processing was always in electronics the optical fiber were just used as a transport medium and laser were used only just for converting the signal uh, from the uh, from the electronics to optical and on the other side actually convert back into the well so the simple thing if you look at uh, this this transmission here you will see that when you want to send a signal over very long distance the signal gets degraded for two things one is of course because of dispersion the pulse gets broadened and second thing the signal amplitude reduces because of the loss and when any of the two becomes unbearable essentially you put a re repeater there and you generate your pulses back right uh, so the repeater actually is a back to back receiver and transmitter and then you clean up the uh, thing in electronics again modulate and put on the optical fiber and like by using multiple hops you can send a signal to your destination over long distances so what one could see that that for a dispersion fiber low dispersion fiber and a data rate about 2 gbps per second and for optical communication the tolerable bit error is about 10 to the power minus 9 that means one bit in 1 billion bits can go wrong that's the kind of standard which we have the most of the links are power limit what it means is that uh, before the signal get distorted because of dispersion its signal to noise ratio gets worse and you have to regenerate because the signal to noise ratio is not really acceptable and that happens typically about 100 kilometers right inside the inside the optical fiber but whenever in communication channel the signal to noise ratio is, uh, is, is, is 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 below that time we never have to generate the uh, the signal in electronically again in fact normal communication system uses simple amplifiers however that time the optical amplifiers were not readily available and that's where the transformation to the new level of optical communication took place when the optical amplifiers got introduced right to get uh, and no repeater were required then you can replace the repeater essentially by a simple optical amplifier right which is extremely small module no conversion to electronics and you could send a signal by multiple hops by using multiple amplifiers right till the time when the signal is distorted enough because of the distortion and at that point probably you can have regeneration of the signal and you can put a repeater there 
So the repeater case spacing can be enhanced by manifold, I think, uh, by using this optical amplifier. And that one of the amplifier, which is called the erbium dope fiber amplifier, that actually transform the way the optical network and optical communication systems work. So the next generation, actually, uh, when it came, the optical amplifier and some many other technologies, actually, that's what changed the thinking, the way optical network uh, would, would, would work. And then the optics started playing much major role right, in sending information uh, in the optical fiber, not barely as a transport uh, kind of uh, medium, and it will convert the light into uh, the electronic bits into light and, and forward, forward them further. So this is about first 25 to 30 years of optical uh, fiber, uh, third generation. Let me take a break at this point. And uh, be before we go to the next generation, uh, fourth generation, uh, where these new techniques are used in communication. So over to Sri Prakash, uh, if you have any questions at this point of time. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shreva, for uh for actually taking us through the entire evolution of the last 30 years uh, in optical fiber domain. Uh, needless to say uh, that, you know, fiber optic uh, cable has transformed uh, the way we, uh, you know, exchange information, uh, not only, uh, you know, in India, but globally, uh, right? And India too has uh, basically adopted fiber optic uh, transmission and fiber optic cable uh, in its ICT journey uh, in the right manner. So uh, we do have some yeah. questions coming in, uh, uh, Dr. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, first of all, and namaste to all attendees. Uh, I'm sorry I forgot to greet uh, all the attendees. I mean, we have a, a very large uh, attendance today uh, for this uh, particular session. Uh, Dr. Sab, we had a few questions which we wanted to uh, ask, uh, Dr. Uh, the first one uh, was uh, basically talking about, you talk, talked about glass as a selected and preferred uh, transmission medium. So in that context, uh, sir, will pure silica core fibers enable even lower loss and hence more reach, uh, Dr. Sir? Okay, so if you look, really look at the glass profile, uh, the glass profile uh, after the glass is purified. So the glass which is used for optical communication, uh, for making optical fiber is a highly purified uh, material, purified glass. Right, sir. And the, the what is called the theoretical limit for the loss for glass is about 0 0.16 dB per kilometer. Technology has already achieved about 0 0.2 dB per kilometer. Okay. So even if you enhance technology by significantly, I think we are not going to improve the loss, you know, much more than, you know, 0 0.2 dB, because we are very close to that theoretical limit, which is 0 0.16 dB per kilometer. Okay. Okay. So as long as we are using the material glass, I think that is the, we already hit the limit, which is the lower limit. Of the of the loss uh, for the for the material, right, right, Dr. Sab. And the next question, Dr. Sab, uh, was in your presentation, Dr. Sab, you talked about two optical transmission windows primarily. You talked about thirteen hundred nanometer, which uh, uh, gives lower loss, and then of course fifteen hundred nanometer window, which again uh, gave further uh, redu reduced uh, losses there. Uh, but while in your other slide, when you're talking about the generation uh, of uh, uh, optical networks, you actually said uh, the first generation optical networks were in the 850 nanometer window range. Uh, Can you please elaborate on that, sir, please? Yeah, so this is interesting, actually, that this loss profile, which I showed you, was the loss profile where, where after the glass was highly uh, purified. Right. In fact, initially in 60s, when the experiment was done on glass, the loss uh, was not as low as 0.2 dB per kilometer. The low loss was achieved at about, about 10 dB per kilometer. And that time, uh, because there were a lot of impurities which were present in the glass and technology could not clean the glass beyond certain limit at that point of time. Right. At that time, it so happened that there was a pseudo window or low loss point, which was around 850 nanometer. Okay. Second thing which was there was that time the electronics which was there for making lasers, the technology was the gallium arsenide technology. And gallium arsenide as a material can generate light at 850 nanometer. So it was a great coincidence that the low loss window, which was pseudo window at, but low window at that point of time, and the material which could generate light, both could support 850 nanometer window. Right. That's how the first generation started in 850 nanometer window. Later on, when the glass was purified, that pseudo window gone, Right. And then the entire thing shifted actually to 1310 
and where the dispersion was really low and the loss was also reasonably small. Right. right. So that's how the first window actually came, which is 850 nanometer. Right. Right. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Uh, there is uh, one uh, question which has uh, come up here uh, was uh, how about uh, practical applications of photonic crystal fibers in place of conventional fibers and photonic band gap structure application in optical networks? Okay, so photonic crystal fibers uh, people are making and now they are still at uh, research level but people have succeeded in now creating photonic crystal fibers uh, along the length. The, the use of photonic crystal fiber is, first of all, it gives you a more confinement of uh, light. So when the fiber is bent, the losses because of radiation actually are less on photonic crystal fiber. Okay. Second thing, the dispersion characteristics can be manipulated by using photonic crystal, uh, you know, uh, periodicity or the size of the, uh, the photonic crystal uh, elements and so on and so on. So dispersion characteristics can be manipulated. Uh, the radiation loss can be can be reduced uh, on that. So it gives you a much newer dimension actually, but creating those fiber over very long distances because these are like uh, very micro kind of structure which run along the length of the fiber. Right. The creation of them is still a technological challenge, but people are slowly developing them. Right? Right. And that could add a new uh, dimension for the propagation. Right. Wow. Uh, Dr. you also spoke about the dispersion shifted fibers, uh, uh, basically. So in terms of uh, the capacity vis-a-vis -vis the distance uh, uh, these uh, fibers can travel in terms of signal distance, uh, would be in tune of uh, how many kilometers, Doctor? Yeah, so if, you, so if you, basically what we want is, as we saw from channel capacity, we want large bandwidth. And right. bandwidth is related to dispersion. If the dispersion is low, then the bandwidth is large. Right. And low, and low loss depends upon the low loss uh, wavelength. <coughs> so 1550 nanometer has low loss. Right. But originally the, the dispersion was not zero at 1550. Right. So either you could have a zero dispersion at 1310, or you could have a lowest loss at 1550. Right. What dispersion shifted fiber did is. Actually, it shifted the point of zero dispersion to 1550. Okay. So you got both the things. You got low low loss, and you got zero dispersion at the same wavelength. Okay. Right. So you got actually you had a cake and eat it too. So that's the kind um, of uh, situation. Right? right. So you got both the thing which is required for having a high capacity transmission. Right. And that is what dispersion shifted fiber is. Sure. Sure, doctor. Great. So there are tons of questions coming in and we also have limitation of time as well, uh, Dr. Saab. Uh, so I was just thinking that if we may proceed uh, uh, with your uh, next uh, uh, part of uh, your presentation and then uh, uh, we can take more questions uh, towards uh, the end uh, of uh, your presentation. Okay. So let me go back to my screen share again. Hi, Dr. Saab. Okay. Can you see me now? Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see you we, and we can see the screen as well. Right. Right. So, all right. So, so we saw third, three generations there. And as I mentioned there, that essentially the most of the multiplexing and all that actually was done on electronic mode and fiber was used uh, just for uh, convert taking light pulses, you know, across the uh, from one location to another. When the fourth generation came, actually, the lot of new things happened, which are like in you know, optical domain. First thing which has happened is what is called a dispersion management. So, what is dispersion management? As we saw that the dispersion, when the pulse is transmitted in optical fiber, it broadens as it travels from the optical fiber. Right. Now, if I if I don't do anything to that, the pulse will keep on broadening. What, is, what was invented was by changing the dispersion uh, characteristic of refractive index profile of the optical fiber, you could create a negative dispersion optical fiber. And then if you use a combination of the normal fiber and the negative dispersion fiber, then one could cancel the dispersion and you can compress the pulse, right? Just by using a passive fiber introduced in the, in the optical fiber network, right? You can actually compress the pulse back. 
So the diagram shows here the pulse is broadened. Then there is a dispersion compensating unit, which is, can be any of the three possible things here. And then the pulse is again compressed back to its original shape, more or less. Again, it goes on the fiber again, broadens again, compressed by this, using these units. And you can send a pulse over very, very long distance without really regenerating. So dispersion management, which actually kept on uh, adjusting the dispersion of the pulse when it propagates on the optical fiber. That could be done either by using dispersion compensating fiber or by using the fiber brack gratings, which are again very tiny devices of few millimeters, uh, again made from optical fibers, and they could really compress the pulse uh, by using negative dispersion of fiber brack gating. Or if you have a very high speed electronics, then you could use the electronic equalization on the, on the receiver side when you detect the pulses and you can really compress the pulse back and, and you can get a clean data, which is there. So dispersion management was something which, uh, which became a part of the uh, fourth generation uh, telecommunication system. Second thing that I mentioned was the optical amplifier. And this is what is called the erbium doped fiber amplifier. This is again an amplifier which is based on optical fiber, basically. And then we got a new technology, which is what is called the wavelength division multiplexing technology. So let me talk about uh, the erbium doped fiber amplifier. So this is, if you take a normal fiber, and if you dope the fiber with erbium item, then internally there are certain energy levels which are created. And one of the energy level uh, difference that is corresponding to the window in which we want to have the optical transmission, which is 15, 15 nanometer window. So interestingly, if you take a piece of fiber, which is doped with RBM, right, and just a, about 20, 30 meter length of that fiber, and use that piece of fiber as a laser. Now remember, laser is not a light generation source. Laser is actually an amplifier. So if you use this piece of wire or piece of fiber, which is loaded with uh, RBM, and if you pump it with a, la with a laser, which is 980 or 1480 nanometer, this piece of 30 meter of RBM dot fiber will start acting as an optical amplifier. And then it can now then amplify the signal almost about 20, 25 dB by about 20, 30 meter length of this uh, piece of optical fiber. The most interesting part of this amplifier is it covers a band of 1530 to 1570 nanometer. So this amplifier is a broadband amplifier, which practically covers the entire window of 1550 nanometer, right? And that's why the amplifier is very, very uh, useful and uh, has transformed the optical communication in 1550 nanometer window. It also gives you a gain of almost about 20, 30 dB. So uh, it can amplify the signal by almost a thousand times, right? Uh, if you insert these amplifiers, so now you can see that in your in the link when we replace the repeater by amplifiers, the repeater used to be a transmitter, uh, receiver, a combination. Now that the entire thing is replaced by a tiny box, which just carries only a pump laser and just a small piece of RBM fiber, which is about 20, 30 uh, meters of length. So that actually transformed uh, the, the long distance communication uh, in, in this generation. Second thing which, you, which actually changed uh, the scenario is the wavelength division multiplexing. So we saw earlier that when we talked about the window of the optical fiber, the total bandwidth available in each window is almost 15 terahertz, right? The total about uh, 120 nanometer uh, kind of bandwidth which is available in the window. But we could transmit only 10 giga GBPS data at that point of time because the bandwidth could not be accessed in time domain. So it was prudent to use the bandwidth which is available with the optical fiber, instead of using a time domain, one could use that bandwidth into frequency domain or wavelength domain. In, in optical terminology, we call the wavelength. So instead of transmitting only one wavelength right inside that window, if you could transmit multiple wavelengths simultaneously, and each wavelength can carry now a data rate with the maximum data rate, which the, the time domain multiplexing can support, like 10 GPPS, something like that. The capacity of the transmission on the fiber can be enhanced by as many number of new wavelengths you can add to the system. This is what is called the wavelength division multiplexing system, or in short, it is called WDM. So you could add as many uh, wavelengths, if earlier it was called coarse WDM, where the channel separation of what few nanometers, 
later on the channel separation in decreased significantly because the lasers became available technology became more more mature and then you could transmit 32 64 120 at 160 wavelengths inside the same uh, optical fiber so what supported wdm is multi channel transmission what is called wdm the laser became available with, which could operate at multiple wavelengths the dispersion flattened fiber became available where there was a dispersion low dispersion over a very wave, broad wavelength range either in one window or two window or over the entire a spectral width which the low loss window of the optical fiber has and wide band amplifier right which is the edfa which is again a broadband amplifier which is available in 15 to 15 nanometer window further there was advancement into photonic integrated circuits which could do optical functioning like filtering routing multiplexing switching all these thing at the optical wavelengths directly earlier these kind of functions were done electronically so the signals were converted to electronics and then these functions were done again converted into optics and sent on optical networks but photonic integrated circuits actually could facilitate this by doing this everything into optical and the optical domain and then we got what is called all optical networks and that's what actually happened in in 90s we could really do everything or many things actually in the optical domain itself the international telecommunication union then defined this wdm grid and they also defined this multiple bands for transmission for optical window and one of them is of course 15 30 to 15 16 nanometer window uh, which is what is called c band and the channel separation was 0.8 nanometer which is 100 gigahertz that's what i used uh, standardized and each channel could carry 10 gbps kind of data so about 40 channels could be transmitted into this band and they all the channels can be handled simultaneously by the wide band amplifier which is the rbm do fiber amplifier so the effective transmission one could get by in this window then is now 400 gbps per sec just to get a feel this is equivalent to approximate 1 lakh tv channels right uh, transmitted simultaneously by using a single optical fiber later on of course the channel spacing was reduced to 0.4 nanometer right which is about 50 gigahertz uh, the separation and the 40 gbps kind of transmission could could be achieved electronically which is eight times more capacity so each thing then one could get almost 3 terabits per second transmission one could get on a single optical fiber if you can combine the two other bands which are on the neighboring of this l band and n band you can get almost three times the bandwidth which you get here so a single optical fiber by using three bands here one could achieve almost 11 terabits per second transmission Like uh, in a single mode optical fiber, and again to remind you that tera is 10 to the power 12. That means uh, 11 tera means uh, almost 10 to the power 12, uh, 10 to the power 13 bits uh, per second transmission can be handled by the single uh, optical fiber. Now WDM network, of course, we are having now the large number of wavelengths, so the signals are aggregated from various electronic sources. They are time dependent multiplex. and then they are combined into a, a multiplexer which is what is called a wavelength division multiplexer so different signals are put on different carriers different wavelengths they are multiplex and then they are put on the optical fiber in the form of wdm on the other side you are having a dwdm demultiplexer where the different channels are separated again electronically converted demodulated and you got your tdm again they are the back well many times you are not sending information only from one point to another you have to drop the signal in between and you require the, the optical add drop multiplexer so again as i mentioned earlier earlier these kind of operations were done electronically but once this photonic the, the integrated photonics came you could use uh, the dropping adding of the signals in the optical domain directly by using what is called the add drop multiplexer so this technology then uh, was built and you got various topologies uh you know by using this wdm technology you could have the physical technology which is a ring technology topology right again uh, uh, which you see in normal networks uh, you can have the ring topology with the drop uh, multiplexers where signal can be added in between right and there could be terminal uh, equipments you can have the complete mesh kind of topology where signal can be connected from different uh, uh, through optical optical which is done in normal network all that can actually can be achieved by using the the optical interconnects and the integrated optical circuits 
So that's what actually happened in the fourth uh, generation. So in 90s, uh, you see, 90s and early uh, part of this uh, century, you will see that the WDM technology actually enhanced the capacity of the optical communication by many four. And since the laser technology was matured, it could give you really a very narrow spectral with width, which could have a multiple uh, transmission of the channels. You could enhance the capacity by adding more and more channels right, and enhancing the capacity of the optical communication. So WDM technology actually enhanced the capacity by, by many, many fold. Then came what is called the fifth generation system, optical communication system. Again, let me remind you that uh, so far, though we got now in fourth generation, we got the optical uh, routing and, and those kind of functions. The data which was transmitted, it was still in the form of only normal binary bits. That means if you really see the modulation point of view, the modulation was still was the primitive from the modern communication angle. Right? You could send the, what is called the modulation, which is the amplitude modulation or on off keying kind of modulation where pulse is on, uh, one means on and zero means off, is the most primitive modulation scheme one could really uh, think of. So once the fifth generation uh, came, the modern communication uh, modulation formats then could be employed into at optical domain. Why this happened? Because the laser technology got improved and one could get now the semiconductor lasers which are having extremely narrow spectral width, which can give you a very clean spectrum of modulated optical signal. And once you could do that, one could I mean, employ all the coherent techniques which were normally used in radio communication in the optical domain also. Also, one could use the polarization multiplexing, right, for enhancing the capacity of the communication by, by, by factor of two. So by enhancing uh, the modulation for, for format techniques, so instead of sending now the information in the form of bits, the concept of the bytes came, right, and you could use the, the modulation, which could be amplitude and phase modulation. You could have, you can modulate the phase of the optical signal, right, because your, your laser uh, signal quality is very, very pure, and you could use various kind of uh, the modulation format like QPSK, 16COM, and by using this, you can transmit the data in bouts now, right, where the data rate can be increased essentially by the, by, by the same form. So the intrinsic data rate, whatever, whatever was there, which was supported by, by, the, by the bandwidth, the fiber, by using different formats, the modulation format, the channel capacity of the optical fiber could be increased by using the technique, what is called the coherent communication. And then when we are using this kind of modulation formats, then the figure of merit now becomes the spectral efficiency. That is not only the bandwidth, but now how many bits you can transmit per second per hours of bandwidth available from the channel. So earlier when we we're transmitting the data, and even if you use the, the channel spacing of 50 gigahertz, and you transmit about 40 Gbps uh, data by using binary transmission, you could transmit only about 0.8 bits per second per hertz. So that was the spectral efficiency, which was less than one. However, by using now these modern uh, modulation techniques, the spectral efficiency could be more than one. You could transmit more number of bits than what is the bandwidth available in terms of hertz. So, and then electronic signal processing you can do uh, to, to really do different kind of formatting here. So the graph shows here the spectral efficiency, which from 1990 onwards in coherent communication increased, again, linearly in the logarithmic graph, right? So it went off by right, factor of 10, factor of 10, right? From to 90 to almost 2010, by almost factor of 100, uh, the capacity was increased by using different modulation techniques. The, Commercial thing, 2011, which was launched, the 640 WDM channels. Each channel spacing is 12.5 gigahertz, 107 GPPS with two polarization over 320 kilometers were demonstrated. And this could carry uh, data almost 64 terabits per second, effectively, right, uh, on, by using this uh, coherent communication technique. So now one can see from this graph, by using different modulation for techniques, <clears throat> one could increase the spectral efficiency, right, in this logarithmic graph almost linearly, 
but you see that at some point here there is a something called a fiber capacity limit and this is about 2000 uh, you know 15 or something right this limit uh, you will not be able to go beyond this limit now this is something interesting that if you if you are talking about the channel capacity and the spectral efficiency and if you go by the shannon's formula then by increasing the efficiency for increasing the more power inside your system you can increase the channel capacity right so there is no there is no limit actually on the, from the channel uh, on the capacity from the signal to noise ratio point of view so if i go by the original shannon's formula you will see that according to shannon the capacity can be increased by signal signal to noise ratio so by increase the optical power the the the, the capacity should increase however this is not true for optical fiber and this is because that as the increase of the optical fiber increases there are non linear effects which start getting set up inside the optical fiber right and because of this non linear effect you will see that the graph shows that beyond certain signal to noise ratio the spectral efficiency again starts dropping it doesn't increase so you take for example a 500 km which is this red dot curve here right up to about 30 db uh, snr the 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 spectral efficiency almost is following the shannon's uh, shannon's curve but beyond that if i go then the spectral efficiency again start up right so in optical uh, communication one cannot increase the capacity of transmission by just increasing the optical power and that is because the non linear effect starts playing role right inside the optical fiber so if i take a 1000 km transmission in, in inside c band and if i use uh, the 100 nanometer at the full band which is there and at 12.5 tera has uh, transmission 8 bits per second that's what you can get approximately uh, you know from this curve here and two polarization you can transmit almost 200 terabits kind of uh, data you can transmit by using uh, uh, in, in c band by using this uh, the, the modulation the coherent communication technique so once this coherent communication techniques came in wdm uh, was there there are so many uh, capacity high capacity submarine systems were launched and this table actually gives you uh, the sort of like systems which are known may not be list is not exhaustive anyway but it start from 2001 and you are having this launch which is 2.56 terabit capacity system over 13000 km 64 wdm channels four pairs of optical uh, fiber and like that and there is a recent one which is the arctic fiber which is from japan to to uk and then which is the uh, i think the spot it is so 2015 and you see about the capacity is about 8 terabits per second the length of this is 18000 km fiber and 50 wdm channels and there are four channels which are uh, which are there so worldwide actually this high capacity optical channels uh, were were launched and that's what you see essentially changed the entire uh, scenario of the data transfer across the world in last 10 20 years in fact from indian point of view as you must be knowing the pm inaugurated uh, the chennai andaman cable in august 2020 which is a 2312 km channel recently i just read in the in the news that the jio has announced in may uh, 2021 that they are going to launch uh, 200 terabits per second 16000 km uh, the submarine cables one towards europe and one towards asia so these are two systems one is uh, india asia express and other one is uh, india europe express uh, and our 200 terabits capacity which will be transmitted here so you see that the whole world actually is interconnected by using this uh, high capacity cable right that's what he's already happened now. now even future when you cut you see that one fiber capacity is again now limited you will not be able to transmit uh, at certain limit which is because either non linear effect because of the bandwidth which is available wdm channel and so on and so on if you wanted to enhance the bandwidth further or the capacity of the optical fiber further then there is a possibility of using further modes of multiplexing one is what is called the space division multiplexing other one is what is called the mode division multiplexing and of course one can have code division multiplexing which is not very attractive from optical domain because uh, the there is always the light intensity you know and currently you have to add the signals and so on but this kind of uh, modulation or multiplexing techniques can enhance the uh, the capacity further 
So what is space division multiplexing? Instead of using only one core in the optical fiber, if I could use multiple cores inside the optical fiber and inside one cladding, then each core carry the entire WDM data and whatever the whole capacity is. And there are multiple cores available there now. So the capacity can be enhanced by as many number of cores you are having optical fiber. To start with, you can actually use multiple fibers which are already there in the, in the, in the, in the network. And you can pass, use multiple fibers to send the parallel WDM data Right, on the on the different fibers. You can also use what is called the, the multiplexing of modes. What that means is that instead of using a single mode optical fiber, the multiple modes can be transmitted, right? And each mode actually can be carrying about the entire WDM data, and different modes uh, can be transmitted in the fiber. And you show here the different intensity patterns which are launched, which actually correspond to different modes, which can be separated on the other side. And again, separated into different WDM data and then demultiplex into uh, uh, electronic uh, data. So, more division multiplexing can use now a fiber which is a deliberately developed a multi mode fiber or what is called the few mode fiber. You cannot have a very large number of modes because when you talk about uh, uh, the, the multi mode propagation, the dispersion, and many other factors uh, will, will start playing a role. So, a few mode fiber, if you create, then the entire WDM capacity can be put on each of the modes and the capacity can be enhanced uh, by a number of modes which you can launch inside the optical fiber. So we require proper dispersion management actually for the few mode fiber because different modes will have different, different uh, uh, dispersion characteristics. It will also require a multi-mode uh, amplifier because again amplifier gains are going to be different when we talk about different mode uh, propagation and you, that, that will be a little bit challenge. And then we require also the mode multiplexer and demultiplexer, right? Because you have to separate out these modes, right? With efficiency, without least crosstalks. And when these channels propagate inside the optical fiber, they should not couple with each other and exchange power. So these are some of the things which uh, are at the research stage, and people will be uh, uh, sort of exploring the possibility of enhancing the capacity further. So if I put now the combination of all together. The space division multiplexing, the wave division, wavelength division multiplexing, and time division multiplexing. You will see that the channel capacity on the vertical axis, right, which is given in gigas, terahertz, and on the horizontal axis, you are having the number of optical transceivers uh, circuits right, in one, one direction, WDM plus SDM, which is N. And by having now the WDM channels and the number of more parallel uh, channels by either uh, space division multiplexing, you can enhance the capacity here. So the red line here, which shows essentially, which is the limit which is achieved by the TDM and the WDM, and which is almost 100, 200 terabits per second. And if you want to enhance the capacity further, you can use the SDM and WDM right, to enhance the capacity by using more uh, cores of the more modes right, inside the optical fiber. Well, this is happening on the backbone. Now you'll see that when the 5G is almost on, on, in, on the door, you will require now the high capacity optical fiber, not only on the backbone, and even probably in the access network. Because now, when we go to the 5G, you will require a very low latency, you will require less than one millisecond. The data traffic is going to be 50 exabytes uh, per month in 2021, and this is, uh, is going to increase by many fold as the time moves. The peak data rates could go more than 20 gigabits per second. The available spectrum now is going to be in millimeter wave uh, range, which could be 30 gigahertz. And, uh, and the connection density is going to now 1 million connections per square kilometer. So you, you have to handle now a very high rate data, very large bandwidth, not over long distances like backbone, but even in the local area network when the 5G comes, where the things get connected, uh, not only the, uh, the video and text, but even the, the internet of things, where everything will get connected through the, through the internet, you will require a huge bandwidth actually in the, in the access network also. So the fiber is not going to now remain restricted to only backbone, this high capacity. You have to bring back the, now the fiber almost to the, the access point, right? So the small uh, access point which will be created, uh, you know, which will be a small cell size, which you will see in the 5G cell distribution, you will have all get getting connected by using optical fiber because that is going to require the high capacity. So why is fiber necessary for 5G? 
the creation and uh, transfer of real time data because the data rates are going to be very very high you require large bandwidth the increase uh, network demand uh, which, which which is there and high radio frequencies and small cells right and which is again going to handle the capacity so you will you have to have the fiber coming almost to the small cells access point because that's where the large bandwidth uh, data is now coming so the scenario which is going to emerge now is going to be dense optical fiber network Right. Even in the local area, you will see a very, very high capacity uh, networks, right, which is going to handle uh, the 5G data, right, and uh, you will see the fiber is uh, getting uh, pervasive everywhere as the time is moving. So just to summarize how the things have happened, uh, you know, from the inception of the optical fiber, you see that the 1980s or 70s, uh, we could transmit the data only about 10 megabits per second, and then it, it went on increasing higher and higher. By the time we went to 2000, we were transmitting data in about one to terabits uh, per second. By the time we came to 2020, we were transmitting data in almost about 100 terabits uh, kind of uh, systems which are, which are available now. And then as we are going to move further, right, the, the yellow arrow shows here, the research development which is going to take place in the space division multiplexing, right, which is going to enhance the capacity right, by using the space division multiplexing. And by the time we reach to 2030, we expect Again, a increase of almost 100 times more than what we are having at that rate which we could achieve in, in 2020. So you see the whole journey is extremely phenomenal, right? That uh, in last uh, just about 50, 60 years, the starting from about few megabits kind of transmission, the optical technology has taken us to transmission of exabytes transmission across the globe within, uh, within no time. So that's the journey, essentially, which is the exciting journey of uh, optical communication. So thank you very much. Uh, let me stop uh, at this point, and uh, when you have questions, we can uh, we can talk more about uh, other issues. Thank you so much. Pratap, uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, this wonderful session, Pratap. It was uh, nectar of knowledge, you know, highly enlightening uh, for uh, me as well as the entire audience uh, today who were who were. Uh, on the on the on the Zoom call today, uh, Dr. The questions are still flowing in uh, big time, and uh, uh, and we do have some time to take uh, a few of these questions, uh, Dr. Uh, I just uh, wanted to uh, check with you, Dr. You spoke about uh, you know SDM uh, in in your slides, which is going to be the sixth generation, uh, uh, you know, uh, technology and uh, expansion capability, which it will provide us uh, to further enhance uh, the transmission. So uh, it has been around as a concept for some time, Dr. Uh, uh, for several decades now, right? But what are the main challenges of making it in, bringing it in the mainstream transmission backbone, uh, Dr. Saab? Yeah, so as I mentioned, actually, when you talk about space division multiplexing, you require, first of all, the multi-core fibers, you know, which can carry the, the WDM data in, uh, independently. Right. So the crosswalk between these uh, fibers, <clears throat> that is something you, which will be a challenge when we talk about uh, the SDM system. Also, the dispersion management, uh, because when we talk about uh, uh, the different fibers or uh, the multi, uh, multi-modal propagation inside this, uh, in, the, in SDM, then those will be challenges. The handling amplification, and again, uh, the exchange of data from one port to another, all those issues actually have to be addressed before we start deploying the system. But at research level, I think things are really going at a very advanced level. So maybe by the end of this decade, uh, the SDM will be, will be deployed. Wow. Right? Uh, and, and you will have that kind of capacity enhancement by using these techniques. Wow. And also looking at the way we are guzzling data, you know, uh, uh, like globally, I think we would need these kind of technologies to really support our uh, data requirements uh, moving forward. Dr. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. for that. So uh, also, uh, uh, you know, do you really see the application of optical technology uh, beh uh, beyond, uh, you know, communications, Dr. Sir? Like for example, in optical interconnects or two optical uh, integrated circuits uh, or logic gates, etc., Dr. Sir? Do you really see uh, this being applied across the uh, new uh, space program? Yeah, so, so that may not be optical fiber as such, okay. uh, but that could be optical integrated circuits. So, uh, so basically uh, now people are talking about uh, reconfigurable optical uh, uh, devices which are interconnects, 
or even the ASICs kind of structures. So recently, I just uh, heard uh, uh, about some research where, where they are defining now the, the ASICs in optical domain. So what it means is that you can do the, you can reconfigure your chip in electronic domain for various functionality. Okay. Actually, the same thing can be done in the optical domain also. Okay. So, so this technology is, uh, interconnect technology, of course, is already advanced significantly, but the reconfigurable ASIC kind of technology at a research level, and again, as the way the technology gets advanced and deployed, I think five to 10 years time, you see the technology actually getting deployed in the field. Right. So you see that in this decade, many of these things will happen. Sure. And uh, not only optical fibers, but many of the integrated optical technologies which will get uh, start uh, getting deployed for this high capacity handling of the of the optical data. That's wow. what will happen. Great. I think the future is looking very exciting, uh, uh, Dr. Sab. Uh, so uh, one of uh, one uh, point which you touched, uh, you know, and the conventional wisdom was uh, like uh, fiber has unlimited transmission capability, uh, right? However, you mentioned that there is a physical limit of transmission uh, or capacity. Uh, on fiber due to the non-linear shan uh, uh, channel limit, uh, Dr. Sab. Can you please uh, elaborate a bit more on this, uh, Dr. Sab? Yeah, so, so as I mentioned, uh, the channel here, the, the, the formula says that the capacity is proportional to bandwidth. Right. And also it is the logarithmically varying in the function of signal to noise ratio. Right. So for a given bandwidth, which is given for optical fiber, which is about uh, 30 nanometer in a window, Right. If I increase the signal to noise ratio, uh, ideally is the capacity should go on increasing. Right. But then, as I mentioned, the large number of large power is actually put inside the optical fiber for improving signal to noise ratio. Then what happens is that the material, the material glass, the intensity of light inside the core, which is very narrow, only about eight to ten micrometer, the light intensity becomes very very high. The light density becomes very very high. Right. And at that very high density, the refractive index of the fiber gets modified by the pulse okay. of the light. Wow. So, so normal fiber, the refractive index is the property of fiber. Right. And light propagation takes place inside the fiber. Right. Now what is happening is that the pulse is modifying the refractive index of the fiber. Wow. And when the refractive index becomes modified, the propagation of pulse gets modified. So this is like pulse is modifying the fiber and fiber is modifying the pulse. Okay. This is one thing. Second thing what happens is that now uh, the scattering phenomena, what is called Raman scattering, Berlin scattering, these phenomena actually start uh, showing uh, uh, the effect, right? And there are different frequency generation which take place inside this. So all these nonlinear effects which we, which, we, which we have with the power increases, they actually prohibit the increase of power beyond certain limits. That's what is going to put a limit on the capacity. Though Shannon's formula says that you could have increased the, uh, the signal to noise ratio arbitrarily high. Right. This is, this is prohibit you for enhancing signal to noise ratio beyond certain point. Right. That's what it is. Wow. So this nonlinearity is what is called Kerr nonlinearity, right, which will modify the refractive index right, and other nonlinearity like Ryan scattering, Raman scattering, and they will also start playing the role. Right. Right. Thank you, doctor. Uh, doctor, there was uh, another question here which came in was like uh, in 90s, there was alternative techniques like, uh, you know, optical soliton transmission uh, that were talked about, uh, uh, right, sir. Are they still in consideration in terms of futuristic deployment uh, or uh, that's like uh, quite old technology? Okay, so earlier, if you remember in 19, in 90s, uh, there was a single channel transmission which was taking place. Right. And one of the problems which was there was this dispersion. Right. The pulse are broadening it because of there is a limitation on data rate. Hmm. What was realized that time by using this curve nonlinearity which I talked about, at which uh, where the pulse amplitude modifies the refractive index of the profile. Right. One could show that this nonlinearity actually creates a creates a phenomena what is called the self-phase modulation phenomenon. Okay. And if I use in 1550 nanometer window it creates a dispersion characteristics, which is the opposite of normal fiber, which is gives you a negative dispersion. Okay. Right. So by using combination of this non-linearity and the normal dispersion, one could actually nullify the dispersion. Okay. Right. But then to have this phenomena there, you have to have a minimum amount of power inside the pulse. Right. 
if the power is maintained then you could nullify uh, the the dispersion and then the pulse will propagate without broadening or without shrinking so the propagation will be almost like a particle right that was what is called the solid arm okay okay but the but the challenge there was how to maintain the power inside the optical pulse because the because when the pulse travels the because of loss the power reduces right if the power reduces the dispersion normal dispersion now takes over the only right. so the broadening start take place if the broadening start taking place again the amplitude reduces right and then the then the game is lost right so that time the high power transmission to maintain the the power level to get this non linear effect that was something which was which was the challenge right the wdm option came much easier because laser technology got enhanced right you could put multiple channel transmission there right and once you increase the capacity by using wdm which was much easier option available the solid arm propagation got back seat there was no need to really transmit high powers to really create solid arms right, right. which was not a very very practical uh, practically attractive option so right. that's the reason that once the wdm came into light the solid arm propagation actually got a back seat Oh, okay. And WDM, WDM gave the capacity which the optical fiber was actually capable of giving you. Right, and and That's WDM right. has like today uh, uh, like given us uh, very high capacity transmission med uh, system, sir, sir, which is really amazing. So I, I think we are really uh, getting a lot of questions, but I, I can only ask now one question, uh, Dr. Sab. Uh, this was uh, a technical question, so I'll read as it is typed. Uh, uh, so in photonic integration of dual wavelength sources. which approach is better has been asked here uh, awg which is arrayed wave light uh, wave guide uh, grating or a multi mode interface reflector no can you can you repeat the question again sorry i in photonic integration of dual wavelength sources which approach okay. is better arrayed wave guide grating using multi mode interface reflector or monolithic integration of distributed feedback laser uh see basically first of all you you have to generate a source which is a wide band source if you want right from the wide band source you have to have the dispersion uh, uh, characteristics used which will generate different wavelengths right which are there so you can use the optical filter by any of the means which could be there right right so it will probably the commerce will decide uh, you know which could be the attractive option but essentially you have to use the multiple wavelengths and which could be uh, filtered out and can be modulated right at the data rate which you are looking for right right so one may not say this or that you can you can have either depending upon you know what kind of technology can really be commercially feasible for you right 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 thank you thank you doctor uh, thank you very much uh, dr sab for uh, taking this questions and uh, you know taking us through this entire revolution uh, from uh, not only the historic times but you also talked about how the future uh, of optical transmission will look like I think it was really an amazing session. I was really fortunate to be part of this uh, session, uh, Dr. Sab. I would now uh, now like to hand it over to Dr. Sushila Venkatraman uh, 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 for her closing uh, remarks. Uh, Sushila, can you take it, please? Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean this was a completely fascinating session. It took me back years to when Professor Ghatak taught me optics uh, at IIT Delhi. So this is wonderful. and uh, many thanks to you professor shivkant for this absolutely wonderful uh, talk and the the feedback from our participants tell us uh, uh, how much everyone has enjoyed this talk and thank you shri prakash for doing such a wonderful job of moderating despite the number of questions that have come in thank you so much so let me just summarize uh, what we've seen in this last one uh, one and a half hours uh professor uh, shivgankar started by taking us through the fact that in the last 100 years many many technologies have had a huge impact on our lives but nothing has disrupted our lives the way the internet has it has touched every aspect of our lives whether it's the way we learn the way we get medical care uh, entertain play communicate and in fact live just about every aspect of our lives has been touched by the internet we had some interesting statistics on the average uh, people spend 7 hours a day 
on the internet. That's what we all do. And almost two and a half hours of that is on social media. We have, we see 2.5 quintillion bytes of data going across the internet, which pretty much translates into 300 terabytes per second, which is an unimaginable amount of data. And the only way this was made possible was because of optical technologies. Otherwise, it would absolutely not have been possible to make this happen. We saw a very fascinating description of how, uh, how fundamentally how fiber optic technologies work and uh, how it evolved from when it was posited by the father of fiber optics, uh, Professor Kapani, to through four generations of fiber until 2000 or so. And then in the fourth generation, we saw how yet another leap was made with different materials and topologies. Yet another leap when we look at the fifth generation by using different modulation modes and how uh, then what is possible to be done to overcome fiber capacity limits. And then we looked forward and looked at the sixth generation and how uh, ideas such as space division multiplexing and mode division multiplexing, um, as well as multiple cores can all come together to almost create an infinite capacity on the fiber optic backbone. But then 5G throws us uh, a new set of challenges as far as technology goes. And, um, and this is not just about the backbone. This is now about a lot of local connections and how to make them really high capacity. Uh, and when you add in the internet of things, which uh, as we saw, the number of mobile uh, users is now at 10.8 billion, which is much higher than the 7.8 billion population of the earth. And that is accounted for largely by the IoT that comes in, the, the Internet of Things. And if we add all of that in, uh, and that's going to grow again exponentially, right? So when we add all that together, uh, obviously the dense fiber networks that are expected are going to be absolutely critical. And without that, 5G simply just cannot exist. So that, uh, it, it, this has been a wonderful uh, session, very, very educative. Uh, and a lot of people have said, uh, stated also that, Professor, you simplified it and made it ever so easy for everyone to absorb and understand. And yet there was a lot of technology, uh, technical content. So thank you very much once again, uh, both to you and Sri Prakash for this uh, lovely session. And uh, to our uh, audience, thank you all for being here. The time for your questions. We are sorry that we couldn't take all of them, but we will share the question with Professor Shivankar. And um, you know, the the session is being recorded. Will be on the IITAC YouTube channel on Monday. Please do look for it. And all of our talks are there. You can and please feel free to share this as widely as you like. With that, once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sushila. Thank you, Shivakaji. Thank, Thank you. you. It was such a pleasure. Thank you, you Shivakaji and the IITB uh, AC Center. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>